Today is November the 14th, and just a few days ago, we remembered those who sacrificed their lives to protect us from evil dictators, to give us the freedoms that we enjoy. In addition, November, as of last Sunday, and I'd like to make it the whole month of November, usually it is, November is also a day where we <clears throat> remember and pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. If you look on the website idop.ca, International Day of Prayer, it mentions there that there are over 260 million <clears throat> Christians who are persecuted around the world. Canada as well is not immune to evil and suffering and trials and challenges and unnecessary deaths as well towards innocent lives, even those who are in the womb. Does it ever bother you when you think about the suffering that was experienced in all the world wars, when you think of the persecution of brothers and sisters around the world, when you think of the reality that is evil that exists even in our nation, in our province, or in our city? Does it ever bother you? Does it ever make you question God, going, God, why? Why is this happening? God, why uh, are these things happening to good people, to innocent people? God, why aren't you doing anything about it? Has it ever come across your mind? I know somewhere in a nation I'm not going to mention who we communicate back and forth with. And he shared with me the horrific persecution that he and his brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing in that part of the world. Something so disgusting, I, I can't even mention it out loud, that he shared with me. And just this past week, he sent me the following message. Pastor, we pray for miracles and healing, and God answers. But when we ask God and declare that he changes the hearts of the radicals and the evil people, why is it not happening? I'm not doubting God, Pastor, but feel depressed that God does not take action and change the hearts of the persecutors. The Psalms, most of it written by King David. And then there's Asaph. Asaph who worked for King David and his responsibility was to give constant praise and thanks to the God of Israel. That was his responsibility. That was his role. You can look it up in 1 Chronicles 16, verses 4 to 5. He was to give constant praise and thanks to the God of Israel. But the first psalm that he ever wrote, Psalm 73, I find it fascinating that in the first half of his psalm, he wrestles with God. I want to read to you this first half of the psalm, and I want you to consider if the psalm that was written 3,000 years ago could be relevant for our day today. Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. Uh, folks, normally I read from the NIV. I'm reading right now from the NLT. If you've got your phone, if you want to switch to that, it's NLT, New Living Translation. As for me, my, verse 2, my feet had almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them. 
and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High God have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. The cry of the psalmist as he looks out into the world, Lord, it seems unfair. God, this seems so unjust. God, why are bad things happening to good people and good things happening to bad people, God? I look around and the innocent are suffering while the evil are just hamming it up. God, if you say who you say you are, good and loving and powerful and almighty, why does it seem like you're doing nothing about this? God, you have an answer to all this suffering and evil. The question about suffering and evil and a good God, the question about prolonged trials and struggles and a powerful and loving God is one that is full of emotions. It's birthed from a heart that's aching and hurting and confused. It's not just an intellectual issue, it's an emotional charged issue and subject. So take note of this reality the next time somebody comes to you and starts sharing and pouring out their emotions and thoughts about God and maybe sharing a little bit of doubt as my pastor friend shared in that message to me, sharing a little bit of doubt and confusion about this God whom they've prayed to and loved and followed all these years and decades and yet it seems like the struggles are so hard that it brings them to this place of emotional distraughtness. Pay attention to that because when you're talking with somebody like that, the last thing they need at that moment is just verses to be recited from the Bible with all kinds of promises. They probably already know those promises. They already know those verses. The first thing we ought to do is respond with a heart of empathy, a heart of compassion, a heart desiring to comfort. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. Because of the emotions that's attached to this difficult subject, this very delicate subject that I'm going to try to address this morning, I've chosen to talk about this subject by sharing with you a very personal journey that I have gone through and our family have gone through. Share with you the emotions and the struggles that we have gone through. Yet in the midst of this valley, I've discovered some truths that I want to share with you as well. Truth that can give us hope and encouragement and a desire to keep persevering. Let's pray. Father, we're about to talk on a subject that has caused many to wrestle with the character of God. Even now, many of us in this room or watching online, we have our fair share of struggles and challenges, heavy burdens, trials that have lasted not just weeks, but months and years, maybe even decades. <clears throat> and I pray that you would bless us with hearing from your heart this morning and from your word. In Jesus' name. Anybody said? Amen. <clears throat> I want to first point out two realities, two obvious realities that we must acknowledge when we're experiencing suffering and evil. The first reality is this, that we live in a world, we live in a society that often tries to avoid taking personal responsibility and instead turns everything over to a blame. Blaming others or blaming God. 
So here's my first obvious reality. When we're experiencing trials and struggles and suffering, please do a little bit of a self-reflection. Consider for a moment if maybe we're facing it because natural consequences of actions we've taken, decisions we've made, and we're experiencing natural consequences of that. And if so, that's time where we come before God and ask for forgiveness and help us to repent and turn our life around. That's the first obvious reality. The second obvious reality is this, that if you look at your circumstance, if you look at the trials and the suffering, and there doesn't seem to be any natural consequence to it, where it seems like it's out of our control, in that moment, we've got to ask ourselves a very important and pertinent question. One question that remains that we must ask ourselves is this. Ready for it? We'll get to it at the end of the message. Our journey. Our journey began in the March of 2000 when we brought Caitlin home our firstborn, and naturally as brand new parents, we had all the different kinds of concerns and worries, and yet also all kinds of joys and dreams. Dreams of maybe what life will be like as new parents with this little girl. As she grows up, the fun we're going to have, and the love that God just blesses in our hearts trying to raise up this beautiful daughter of ours. All these beautiful dreams. Praying for her. For God's dreams to be fulfilled in her life. And in our lives as a family. But it wasn't too long until a massive storm started making its way into our family's life. For you see, within a year, Michelle was experiencing unprovoked crying and sadness. We took her to the doctor, and the doctor diagnosed her with postpartum depression. Thankfully, with just a little pill, she was able to come out of that. When we found out she was pregnant with Nathan, he put her on that little pill to protect her from the postpartum depression, and it worked. Nathan was born November 10th of 2002. Fast forward to the late summer of 2004. When we experienced such devastating losses back to back that we were able, barely able to grieve one loss before we got the next one. The first was when Michelle's dad, after 35 years of marriage, decided to say, I'm done. And broke off the relationship to be with a younger woman. A Christian man, an elder in his church. Devastating. Barely able to grieve that within a short month after that. And I don't understand this because I'm not a cat lover, but the third cat that Michelle owned died within a month of that. That was a significant loss. More for her than me. <laughs> within a month after that, barely able to grieve the loss of a broken marriage, a loss of an animal, Michelle started experiencing symptoms that we couldn't understand what was causing it. We went to the doctor, and the doctor let us know that what she's been experiencing and why she experienced it, because she had a miscarriage of our third baby. By fall of that year, late fall, the dark, dark storms of depression hit my wife and just knocked her down and out. Sometimes Michelle would be in hospital for weeks or sometimes months on end as the doctors and nurses try to figure out how to get her out of that depression. Our children were two and four. There I am, a single dad, <clears throat> trying to care for these young children and work a full-time job. Every time we visited my wife into the hospital, I started to slowly see her change from the woman that I once knew. 
couldn't even recognize her at times. Over the years, the emotions and the thoughts and the feelings welled up so deeply and so profoundly that I started going through my own journey with God in a way that I've never experienced before. Such intensity of frustration and disappointment and anger. Maybe you've experienced the same too, where questions like the following arise in your heart and mind. God, God, where are you? We had family, friends, church gathered together, praying and fasting for my wife. Where are you, God? When will this end? And I lacked an understanding about all of this stuff, and I still do. I'm not, uh, mental health is such a confusing subject. But I lacked understanding, which made me lack empathy uh, towards my wife and understanding, where I said some foolish things like, honey, why don't you just snap out of it? Don't you know what you're doing to my, our family, to me? Awful. But then when I couldn't lash out at my wife, I lashed out at God. Do you care, God? Do you see what's happening here, God? Do you understand how much more of this can we handle, God? Why aren't you doing something about it, God? On one occasion, I'll never forget this. I felt so abandoned by God. I raised my fist at him. I can still picture it right now in the car, slamming my fist on the steering wheel and raising my fist at him, saying, God, I'm going to make you feel the pain I'm feeling. When you're so deep in pain and sorrow and emotions, you're not thinking straight, are you? <laughs> I feel so abandoned by you. Well, maybe, God, I need to abandon you for a little while so you can feel the same pain I'm feeling. <sighs> How many Christians in the midst of such suffering and pain and sorrow and struggles, have struggled in the same way or maybe even in a more intense way than what I've shared with you this morning. But I'm so thankful for God's patience with me. <laughs> Actually, yesterday I was talking with my dad, Michelle and I with my dad. And that's one thing that I said to my dad. I said, Dad, as God looks at this world, I'm blown away by his patience. I'm so thankful for God's patience with me. Because he journeyed with me. And in this journey, he helped me discover a few truths that I want to share with you that will hopefully encourage you and help you persevere no matter what you're facing now or will face into the future. Truth number one. The Christian faith is the only one that speaks of a God who knows and feels our suffering. The Christian faith is the only faith that speaks of a God who truly knows and feels our suffering. Our God is the only one that truly understands what pain we are going through and can truly empathize with us because he's the only one that left heaven itself to come down and experience pain and suffering and evil and abuse in the hands of the very people that he created in his image, the very people that he says he loves. And the cross, Today's communion is we're going to focus on the cross. The cross is the most profound expression of God's understanding of pain and suffering and even where Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt abandonment. John Stott said the following words, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it?
This is why we as Christians can confidently yet lovingly say Jesus is the only way, truth, and life to our God. There's no other way under heaven by which man can be saved. No other way by which we can be restored into relationship with God except through Jesus Christ. For all other religions, worship a God who never, ever experienced this kind of pain and suffering, willingly chose to do that even though we didn't deserve it. Other religions worship stone or wooden idols or false gods or prophets who promote violence rather than peace and love and hope. Oh, this Jesus we are told in Scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave, he willingly gave so that all who would believe would never perish but have eternal life. Truth number one. Our God is the only one that truly can empathize, understand, feel what we're feeling in the midst of our pain, suffering, and sorrow and trials. That gives us hope. That gives us peace. That gives us a little bit of reassuring comfort. Second truth. Suffering shakes the world of its apathy and wakes us up to love and generosity. Suffering shakes the world out of its apathy and wakes us up to love and generosity. The beauty, if I can call it that, and yes, it is beautiful in many ways, uh, the silver lining in the midst of suffering and pain is how it raises up people, how it raises up churches, and sometimes even raises up nations towards love and generosity, towards caring and supporting those who are in desperate needs and suffering and in loss. Our family has been on the receiving end of so much love and generosity and care and comfort and support through some of the darkest times in our lives that I shared with you earlier. And they lovingly gave of themselves. And I'm sure many of you have experienced as well the love and generosity, care and comfort of others when you're going through your darkest times as well. Suffering wakes us up to love and generosity and comfort and care, and even wakes us up to God. As somebody once said, I don't know who it was, there's no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> Sometimes suffering wakes us up to God. To the Corinthian church whom Paul said, remember this, that the God who comforted you with that same comfort, you should comfort others. We just read that in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. Just a few verses later, he also said the following, and our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Folks, would I have preferred that we never experience the pain and suffering of Michelle going through the deepest parts of depression and anxiety? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do I still pray for Michelle to be fully healed and for God to give her abundant life? Yes. Do I believe he can do that? Yes. Do I know if he's going to do it this side of heaven? I don't know. But God, for such a time as this, has chosen to use this journey for his glory in just amazing ways and to the benefit of many people. And that brings me to truth number three. Truth number three. Suffering moves us into a greater dependence upon God. Suffering moves us into a place of greater dependence upon God. When I was crying out to my God with my fist in the air, slamming the steering wheel, saying, I'm about to abandon you, God, I'm done. I'm done. In God's beautiful patience and love, in that moment, he reminded me of a verse in Scripture do you remember when Jesus was teaching his messages and there was hundreds of his followers, maybe even thousands, that said, I find this too hard to believe. It's too hard to follow. And they walked away from Jesus. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, will you leave as well? And I think it was Peter that said, Jesus, 
to whom shall we go? In that moment of slamming my fist and steering wheel and raising it up at God, in his beautiful, gentle way, he reminded me of that verse, Steve, if you abandon me, to whom will you go? Suffering moves us into a place of greater dependence upon God. Do you remember Joseph? Joseph. I mean, we've heard of sibling rivalry. (laughs) But these brothers of his threw him in a well, left him for dead, until they saw a caravan coming and thought, hey, we can make some money out of this guy. Sold him to this caravan. This caravan then sold him to the Egyptians and to Pharaoh. Living in slavery, jailed, falsely accused, all kinds of stuff that he faced. Eventually there came a time where he was going to be reunited with his evil brothers who threw him down the well for dead. His evil brothers that went to dad and said, sorry dad, Joseph, the beloved one of yours is dead who could barely imagine how much his father must have been crying out in pain at the loss of his son, yet he is fully alive. He's about to be reunited with these brothers. And he's Pharaoh's right-hand man. He's got every power and authority given to man on earth. What's he going to do with these brothers? Genesis 50 verse 19 and 20. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. The reality about our God is that He sees the big picture when we just see a tiny part of it. In the good and in the bad, in the joy and in the suffering, God can use it and turn it for good. We know that verse in Scripture, Romans 8, 28. Some of us have even memorized it. We've quoted it to ourselves, and at the appropriate time, we've quoted it to others. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who've been called according to His purpose. We love that verse. It encourages us, it blesses us. But have you noticed, when you read that chapter, have you ever noticed where that verse is located in that chapter? Think you've noticed it? You're nodding your head? just before that one verse and just after that one verse sandwiched in the middle is this verse on goodness but on both ends of it have you ever noticed what the subject or the theme is let me read it to you verse 17 and 18 we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Verse 26, still before verse 28, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And then the verses after that. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And verse 35 and verse 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine? Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you catch that? Right in the middle of this verse and God working all things out for good for those who love him and call according to his purpose. On both ends of this is all kinds of subjects about suffering and of weaknesses and of troubles and of persecution and of all kinds of pain and evil we might be experiencing. Why did Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, put that one verse, Romans 8, 28, right in the middle of all this suffering and pain and weakness and trouble and hardships? Why? Because I think he did it for a reason and a purpose. A beautiful message that God is sending us. He's telling us, folks, when you're suffering, when you're going through trials and struggles and hardships and feeling weak, 
Don't ever forget, I'm right in the middle with you. I'm right there in the middle of it all with you. I'm walking with you, right in the middle of your pain and suffering, and I'm going to turn it towards good. I am walking alongside you. That's why Psalm maybe 23, verse 4 says the following, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we rush through reading Scripture, and we need to just be careful and pay attention to why verses are located where they're located. So in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of all your confusing trials and overwhelming stress, when you look around and it feels like uh, like, that life is unfair and God is unjust and you're crying out, where is God? Remember these following truths. Remember this, that our God is the only one who truly understands the pain and the suffering and the weaknesses you're experiencing because he's been there, done that, and bought the (laughs) t-shirt. He truly understands. And he comforts us. He doesn't slam us with Bible truths right off the bat. He's there to comfort us first in the midst of our suffering and trials. And why God, why God? Read for yourself how God dealt with Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. Read for yourself how he dealt with Elijah. Second, suffering awakes humanity to selflessness and love and can even wake us up to God. Suffering awakens us to selflessness and love, to come alongside people and support them and show them comfort and encouragement and care. The God of all compassion and comfort, we can comfort others. And thirdly, even though we may not feel it or notice it in the moment, in all those times of suffering and trials, even when we may not feel it, Know this truth, that God is walking alongside us when we're right in the middle of it all. And he will somehow turn it for good. So if we accept and believe these truths, remember I said there's two obvious realities. The second reality is there's going to be one question that remains. One critically important question that remains. If we believe all of these truths, And the question is this, in the midst of your suffering and evil, in the midst of your pains and struggles, will we still trust God? Will we still trust God? Oswald Chambers said the following, Faith is confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. Faith is confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. And if you're not going to trust God, then who will you trust? Stephen Curtis Chapman singer and songwriter, been in the business for over 30 years, won countless awards. Him and his family experienced tremendous tragedies. The worst of one of it all is when their adopted five-year-old little girl, adopted from China, was run over by a car backing out of their driveway and killed instantly. Five-year-old little girl, right in front of her eyes, their eyes rolled over by a car. If that wasn't bad enough, the person that rolled over this little girl was her older brother. From that trauma and that tragedy, this song came to be.
Father, you know what each person in this room or in their living rooms right now are going through. Whether there's deep health issues, whether it be family struggles or tension, marital struggles, whether it be deep losses, and you know, Father, as well, the cry of each person's heart. Where on one side they're crying out, begging you to help. And it seems that you're staying silent. But on the other side, they also trust you. God, you are God, and we are not. And you alone are worthy of all of our trust, all of our worship. And if it's been a while since maybe some of us who've been crying out to you have experienced just that sense of you being close to us. You walking with us in the darkest valley. I pray today would be the day, even this moment, that we would just not know it and believe it, but experience it in such a way that it transforms our hearts and minds in the way we live through each day, in the way that we treat one another, in the way we care for one another. Our God, thank you. for we can never ever doubt your love and your goodness and your justness when we look at the cross all doubt goes fades away so now father in whatever state of mind or heart we are right now in we give you the worship you deserve to the best of our abilities. And in this time of worshiping you, come and minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Please stand. We're going to sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. <laughs> 